This campaign is a fight for the future. And we will make America great again. Hello, I'm Caitlin Huey Burns here in the Spin Room in Philadelphia. Welcome to a very special presidential debate edition of America Decides. In just a few hours, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump will take the stage here in Philadelphia. And tonight's debate will be the first time the two presidential candidates have ever met. Trump is set to arrive in Philadelphia during the 6 p.m. Eastern hour, and Harris arrived on Monday after preparing for the debate in Pittsburgh yesterday. Uh, yesterday, uh, she said in a radio interview that former President Trump would lie during the debate. There's no floor for him in terms of how low he will go, and, um, and we should be prepared for that. And for Harris, it's an opportunity to introduce herself to voters. As many Americans say, they still don't fully know her or her policy positions. While Trump is expected to face a tougher battle than the one against then-Democratic nominee President Biden back in June. If I destroy her in the debate, they'll say, Trump suffered a humiliating defeat tonight, no matter what. And Weijia Jang and Robert Costa join us now here in Philadelphia. They've both been covering all sides of this wild campaign. Great to see you both. Um, so this is the first debate of the general election between these two, but it's not the first debate that we've had in this general election. Um, Weijia, I want to start with you because we've seen Donald Trump debate in this kind of setting many times before, but we haven't seen Kamala Harris in this type of setting in a presidential debate in a general election. Um, talking to her campaign, and I know you've been covering her all weekend as she's been here in Pennsylvania, how does her campaign see tonight? What are they hoping to accomplish? You're right. This is her first presidential debate ever, and this is Donald Trump's seventh. Mm -hmm. So he certainly is familiar with this setting, with the format. Um, and so she approached this like a very diligent student. And that's what she's been doing in Pittsburgh for five days. And then here in Philadelphia, she's been studying. She has been looking at his previous performances because, you know, she has records of that. She's looking for information about how to go on the offense, but also be defensive in case he throws attack lines her way. She's also been practicing. Her team built her a stage uh, that replicates the sort of environment she'll face tonight along with the bright lights so there are no surprises. She did a walkthrough today so she knows uh, what she faces and she is approaching this again, you know, taking in as much information as she can so she can perform tonight. You know, it stands in such stark contrast, of course, Bob, to how former President Trump prepares. His campaign likes to say that he doesn't need this kind of preparation that, that Kamala Harris and Biden did, quite frankly. Um, I know you've been talking to campaign sources. What are they telling you about what they're hoping to accomplish tonight? Well, on the Harris side, I'm hearing the same thing as Ouija, that preparation is key and that she is getting ready for this in a very formulaic way, a methodical way. Former President Trump is a, taking a different approach. It's not that he's not preparing. It's that he's having these informal discussions with allies like Congressman Matt Gates of Florida, former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii, making phone calls to people he knows, talking through the issues. He sees this, I'm told, by some of his key confidants as an opportunity to kind of read the room, to mm. see how Vice President Harris is going to approach him in terms of talking points, level of rhetorical aggression, how she's going to try to frame him either as someone who is corrupt or tied to the business establishment. And he's going to wait and watch in the first 10, 15 minutes to get a sense of where she's going. Hmm. And then once he has a conclusion, at least early on, about where she's going with her strategy, mm -hmm. he'll react to that. And there's a, a belief inside the Trump campaign that he succeeded in their view in the first debate because he reacted to President Biden's performance rather than, as they say in politics, going for the kill when mm. he recognized Biden was maybe having a weak night. He let it unfold in its own way, and he just kind of stayed steady mm -hmm. in the moment. So Trump's much more of a reactive player on the mm -hmm. debate stage. And we'll see Vice President Harris 
I'm told she does have that instinct as well. As much as we keep hearing from her aides and advisors about preparation, 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 mm -hmm. she's someone who rose through the ranks of California politics, a former prosecutor in San Francisco, the state mm -hmm. of California. She knows how to navigate a courtroom. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't a prosecution, but it may take some of those extemporaneous skills to come mm -hmm. to the fore if she really wants to have an effective night. She was hoping this was going to be a prosecution. She mm -hmm. was hoping that she would be able to have a direct exchange engagement with her opponent. Mm -hmm. But as we know, she ultimately agreed to the mics being muted when it's not their turn to talk. And her team feels like that's a real disadvantage for her. One, because she can't cross-check Trump in real time. Two, because they believe it serves as a tool that Trump normally wouldn't have, mm. which is to give him discipline mm. on a silver platter by not letting him talk, when in reality, you know, they were hoping that he would, quote, reveal who he really is with an unmuted mic. And it's so interesting because that was a request from the Biden team when Biden was in this race. Um, and it did seem to serve Trump in a way in the last debate. Um, you know, we talk so much ahead of each debate about how much debates really matter when the electorate is so polarized already and there are so very few voters anymore left in the middle. But as we saw back in June, that was one of the most consequential debates we've ever seen. I mean, it essentially uh, got the movement going to uh, for Democrats to remove Biden uh, or to get him to drop out of the race. I'm curious how you two see this one. Uh, just, you know, under 60 days to go until Election Day. Uh, voters will start voting soon in some of these big states with early voting. Uh, does this debate have the potential to really move the needle here, or are these campaigns just hoping to get through and to speak to their particular bases? Well, when it comes to Vice President Harris, the stakes are equally high for both candidates. They're both in the midst of a general election. But she has not run in a primary in this right. cycle. Mm -hmm. She has done one interview since she became the nominee. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been on television. She's done the radio interviews, as we've seen. Yeah. But this is a chance for her to introduce herself to the country in addition to what she did at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, by more f forcefully going on to her policy positions and articulating them to a national audience. For Trump, there's a belief inside his campaign, right or wrong, that he's a global figure. He's yeah. a celebrity. He's already in the history books. And this is not maybe going to change a lot of minds, mm -hmm. but it could rouse his base, make them motivated to come out and vote for him this fall. Mm -hmm. And it could, in some ways, reassure some voters that he is an alternative to the status quo. And that's what he wants to be seen as tonight. There's a mm. battle over the mantra of change. Yeah. Who is the change yeah. candidate? Is, this, is it the fresh Democratic nominee mm -hmm. who has come out of nowhere to be the Democratic nominee, even though she's the incumbent vice president? Mm -hmm. Or is it the former president who still likes to frame himself as an anti-establishment figure? That, that is the battle tonight. Who walks out of that room mm -hmm. at the Constitution Center in Philadelphia and can say, with confidence, I am the candidate of change based on how I perform tonight. Yeah, and each candidate is accusing the other of being essentially the incumbent. And we did so interesting to me because Kamala Harris is the sitting vice president, and yet we see in polling that people still say that they don't know a lot about her and her policies. And that's why this debate is so critical for Harris, not to mention the fact that it could be the only debate. Yeah. Uh, because in other cycles, we rely on three debates. So mm -hmm. if you uh, don't perform well in one, you can come back and sort of have redemption. Mm -hmm. But these two nominees have not agreed to another debate, and we mm -hmm. don't know that they will with just eight weeks left until Election Day. So this could be, you know, one of the only opportunities she has to have such a massive audience and to have clips play on social media and be in the news cycle for days to come, which is why another part of her strategy is to rehearse crisp two-minute answers mm. under the clock so that she can be ready to deliver the message in that short time that she will have tonight. And just an additional point to build on what we just said. The Commission on Presidential Debates, this nonpartisan yeah. organization, ran the debates for years. Now, a lot of people are confused when I'm on the campaign trail about why there aren't three debates this time. Mm -hmm. It's because 
both of the campaigns decided to walk away from this nonpartisan commission that organized the debates and negotiate their own debate mm -hmm. with a respective news network, whether it's CBS with the vice presidential debate mm -hmm. in early October or ABC News tonight, which is hosting this debate, it's simulcast, of course, on CBS. Mm -hmm. We hope you stay with us and watch yeah, it here. That's a good plug. But it's an intriguing political point that the Commission on Presidential Debates, which in the 80s and 90s and 2000s had a three-decade mm -hmm. run of a, as a very powerful group, is suddenly not part of this whole process. Yeah, a lot of norms being broken this cycle. Uh, we never know what to expect, so we just cover it as it comes. And so we will all be watching tonight. And it's such an honor to cover this wild campaign with the two of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And a programming note, we'll be anchoring another edition of America Decides right here in the debate spin room in Philadelphia coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern. And the debate itself, as we were just mentioning, is hosted by ABC News, but you can also watch it right here on CBS News 24-7, and that starts at 9 p.m. Eastern. And ahead of tonight's debate, the Trump campaign is previewing some of its lines of attack that we may expect from the former president. A campaign advisor will join us next here in the spin room to talk about it. You're streaming America Decides, live from Philadelphia. The president didn't find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, so he's really turned his campaign into a weapon of mass deception. I don't see how you can lead this country in a time of war, in a time of uncertainty, if you change your mind because of politics. Welcome back to our special coverage from Philadelphia ahead of tonight's debate. Several Trump allies are pushing the former president to stay on message tonight. Here was North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum earlier on CBS News 24-7. Well, I think when President Trump is talking about the economy and talking about uh, the border and talking about all these things, yeah, he's absolutely winning. And Trump campaign senior advisor Tim Murtaugh is here with us now to talk about it. Good to see you, Tim. Thanks Good for being you. here. Uh, so you heard from Doug Burgum. Lindsey Graham has been saying the same thing. They want the former president to stay on message in this debate. But there's also a feeling among some uh, allies of the former president that, you know, he should let himself let Trump be Trump. Where do you stand? Uh, well, I think that he is the, he's going to be Donald Trump. It's no secret who Donald Trump is. I mean, I, I dare say he's probably the most famous human being on the entire planet. Uh, however, I think tonight will be a debate about issues. And I think the issue set really sets up very well for Donald Trump and uh, for the entirety of the campaign, really, because everyone who's going to vote in this election has lived through both administrations, both the Trump administration and the Biden-Harris administration, and they know what their lives were like during that time. They know that the economy was good, that inflation was not out of control, that our borders were secure, and that the world was generally not on fire when, when Donald Trump was president. And so tonight is going to be an opportunity to make sure this is the first time and maybe the only time that a lot of voters are going to be able to hear Kamala Harris actually speak about her own record and take questions. And the goal, I think, tonight will be to make sure that she owns her entire record because she is, in fact, a San Francisco liberal who was the district attorney in San Francisco, the attorney general of California, a U.S. senator from California, and now the vice president. She has to own the record, and she has a very leftist record in those years. She also cannot be allowed to escape from responsibility for what she has taken part in in the failures of the Biden administration. It's the Biden-Harris administration. The White House is still very clear about that. She owns that record, too. You know, there is a significant gender gap in this election. You see it in our own CBS News polling in these battleground states. Um, Donald Trump, of course, has a new opponent in Kamala Harris, as you mentioned. Uh, but does running against a woman change his calculus heading into this debate? I don't think so, because it's still a campaign about issues, and this will be a debate about issues. Women care about inflation. William, women care about the cost of energy. How much does it cost to put gas in the car? And groceries on the, and food on the table, groceries in the refrigerator. They care about safe streets and safe neighborhoods. They care about a secure border. They care about all these things. And so I think that's the way he's going to approach it. I don't think it matters to him whether his opponent is a, is a man or a woman either. Now, I would say uh, people always talk about the, the women and, and the calculus that goes into that in the electorate. Uh, I, would, I would point out that Kamala Harris has her own gender gap. 
She is well behind Donald Trump in getting the votes of men. And once again, it's the same issue set. It's the economy, it's the border, it's public safety, it's Americans and America's entanglement in these never-ending wars that we once again see uh, in countries around the world. And Amer a lot of Americans are wondering, why are we doing this? Why are we taking care and sending so much money overseas when we should really be taking care of situations here at home? And once again, that is going to be something that Kamala Harris has to own as the vice president for Joe Biden. So talking about those policy issues, uh, lots of allies of the former president say they want him to talk about those policy issues. But uh, Trump has been saying on Truth Social just yesterday or over a couple days ago that he wants to prosecute uh, people that are acting nefariously in uh, the election, already casting doubt about this election and still refusing to accept the results of the last election. Why? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the, the premise of that question sort of presupposes that certain people are okay with people breaking election law. And I don't really think that's the case. If people break election law, they should be prosecuted. But I don't think are. there's anything wrong with that. They are prosecuted. Cer certainly. So why is this such a controversial thing? It's something that we should all agree on. But talking about extending it to legal, um, you know, other legal teams, to donors, uh, you know, it, it, it suggested the idea of prosecuting political opponents. If you're going to ask a question about someone prosecuting political opponents and don't mention that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's Department of Justice are currently, at this moment, prosecuting Donald Trump, then it's not an honest and forthright conversation. They are currently, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the Department of Justice are currently engaged in a prosecution that could end up with them trying to sentence Donald Trump to jail. The way you ask that question, it's though that's not even happening. But it is happening. And I think once you arrive at the conclusion that none of these charges Those are would not have directives been, of the Justice Department. Who is in charge of the Justice Department? Is it an executive branch agency? Who leads the executive branch? Who appoints the Attorney General? The Attorney General is not part of the Constitution as some sort of independent officer. The Attorney General is a member of the executive branch over which Joe Biden and Kamala Harris preside. That's inescapable. I, I do want to talk about the idea of the muted mics. Um, that was a request originally from the Biden team in the last debate, mm -hmm. and your campaign argued for that again this time around, and no. that, that will be the case? No, no, no. Or, or argued for, for the previous rules to be the case. But I'm curious, what kind of impact do you think that would have on, on this debate? It seemed to have served Trump well in the last one. Well, let's remember how we arrived at this point with the rules of this debate. This was a debate that was agreed to originally by the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign. And then, of course, Biden was shown the door by Kamala Harris and others. And then Kamala Harris basically said, if you don't agree to this debate as is, as it was already constructed, then you're a coward. Right. So Trump says, all right, let's do it. We'll do it. And then the Harris campaign actually put out a statement that says the debate over the debate is over. They were happy. And then all of a sudden they said, wait, 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 wait. Actually, now we want to change the rules. And ABC and the Trump campaign said, what are you talking about? We've had this agreement for a long time. And so finally, they're, they're still quibbling about it. They're still griping about the rules. She actually should be worried about having an open mic in front of her because it's going to be on her to try to have to explain how it is that she's at odds with herself. All of these different, we're in Pennsylvania right now. The I biggest issue in Pennsylvania is going to be economically fracking. She is so, that is the process by which you can, one of the processes, you can get yep. oil and natural gas yep. out of the ground. She is so opposed to fracking that when she was the Attorney General of California, she sued the Obama administration. She sued Barack Obama to try to get them to stop fracking off the coast of California. Now she's going to come to Pennsylvania and say, I love fracking. I don't think so. She needs to be worried about the microphone in front of her because how in the world is she going to connect and square that circle? I don't know. Pennsylvania, as you mentioned, key battleground state. We will be here a lot. It is neck and neck, so a state we will be watching. Tim Murtaugh, thank you very much, thank you very much. for your time. We appreciate it. And a quick programming note in the 7 p.m. hour, North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper will join us to preview tonight's debate as well. And that interview will be live right here on CBS News 24-7. And the two candidates, 90 minutes and a lot of facts to be checked. How we'll be keeping track of both candidates and keeping them honest. You're streaming America Decides. I'm reaching out to all Americans, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, because we need everybody to help make our country what it should be, to grow the economy, to make it fairer, to make it work for everyone.
And welcome. Welcome back to a special edition of America Decides live from Philadelphia. CBS News will be fact-checking claims made by both Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump after tonight's debate. Our own Major Garrett will be tackling this endeavor, and Major joins us now. Yeah. Good to see you. Uh, so I know you fact-checked all the statements, or at least as many as we could, uh, by both Trump and President Biden after that last debate back in June. But with Harris taking the stage tonight, it is a different kind of debate. Uh, I'm curious how you are approaching this tonight. Is it any different? Well, first of all, Caitlin, great to be with you. Second of all, I won't be doing this work by myself. We have a CBS News confirmed team of producers and journalists who will be going over everything the candidates say tonight to check them on their accuracy. And you said as we went to break that we're going to keep them honest. Caitlin, you know and I know, no matter how big a team I have behind me, we cannot keep any political figure <laughs> honest. What we can do is hold them accountable for things that they might want to persuade voters they haven't said in the past or make exaggerated claims that need to be rooted into reality. That's the, that's the essence of fact-checking. It's not to harass political figures. It's to weigh their rhetoric against available, verifiable facts, either in their record and speeches or in statistics about what has happened or what their proposals might create in the future. And to the degree that our CBS confirmed team can do that work, we will do it to our best tonight. Yeah, and that is to the service of our viewers who are getting inundated with so much information and more to come tonight. Um, as you mentioned, I mean, you can't check the veracity of every single claim made by each of these uh, candidates. But what issues in particular are you going to focus on for both these candidates? Let's start with Trump, for example. Well, I expect, and if Tim Murtaugh is any example of this, and I certainly believe he is because he's a senior advisor to former President Trump's campaign, there will be a lot of discussion about what the economy was during the Trump presidency, what it was during the Biden-Harris administration, same thing on immigration, same thing on crime. Those are statistically verifiable claims. Former President Trump makes all sorts of the most extravagant and indefensible claims, for example, about immigration. He says 8 million, 10 million, 12 million, 20 million. He keeps amplifying the numbers. Those numbers can be rooted and verified, and we will do that if necessary. He also makes extravagant claims about his economic record, the best that there ever was. We know statistically that's not true, not in terms of GDP growth, not in terms of employment, not in terms of other statistical measurements like stock market growth. So those are kinds of things we can evaluate because we are familiar with the rhetoric from former President Trump. If he uses it again tonight, we will fact check him on that. Same thing with Kamala Harris as vice president. She may try to recharacterize certain hard truths about immigration during the Biden-Harris administration, what the numbers were, what they are now. If she exaggerates or downplays those, we will fact check that. Same thing about her own record, what she held as a position before when she ran, for example, as a Democratic candidate in 2020, what are her positions now? If she tries to say, I never said that or I never believed that, and if there's facts to counter that, we will try to bring that to the surface as well. And Major, you know, we were talking earlier in this hour about how this isn't the first general election debate of this cycle, but it is the first between these two candidates. There are so many things that have happened since the last debate. And I'm curious, from your perspective, how much you think tonight's debate matters in terms of kind of where voters are. And I'm thinking of that in the context of this fact-checking, especially because our polling shows that people are wanting to hear more from Kamala Harris about her policies because they're not as familiar with her as they are uh, about Donald Trump. How could they be? They're only in the last few weeks evaluating her as the Democratic nominee, as the potential next president of the United States. And the Harris campaign has lots of fundraising, lots of sizzle, lots of energy, lots of volunteers. But a good portion of the American public in the battleground states, according to our surveys and other surveys, want to know more. What is your vision? How does it relate to my life? How is it going to improve my life? What's your explanation for things I'm unhappy with, whether that's inflation, immigration, crime, or something else? And who are you? All of those things are going to come up tonight in a fresh new way because... This is the first time, and as we just said earlier, possibly the only time you're going to see this one-on-one -on -one clash of visions, records, and rhetoric. And when there needs to be fact-checking for either candidate, myself and the CBS News confirmed team will be there in service to our viewers. 
And I can think of no better team to do it. Major, thank you for leading that charge, and we'll check in with you again soon. Thank you. And Pennsylvania is not only home to tonight's debate, it's also home to one of the most closely watched Senate races in the country. Earlier today, I spoke to Republican candidate Dave McCormick. He's looking to unseat Democratic Senator Bob Casey. This is a match to watch. McCormick spoke about his support for former President Trump and how he plans to campaign. About a half hour away from here is the presidential debate. I want to talk about your race, but I also want to talk, talk about the top of the ticket. Because you are running with Donald Trump on this ticket in Pennsylvania, the biggest battleground, you can argue, in this election, what do you need to see from him tonight that would give you some confidence in your own race? Well, I, I don't want to presume to give the president feed, you know, uh, counsel on how he should handle the debate, but I think what's clear on the ground in Pennsylvania is the, the contrast between the weak liberal policies that Kamala Harris and Bob Casey are promoting. So in her own words, she wants to ban fracking, transition energy workers. She wants to give amnesty to 10 million illegal immigrants, make sure they have federal benefits. She wants to have mandatory buybacks of guns, eliminate private health insurance. These are in her own words. And that's the contrast. It's a, it's a, a number of San Francisco liberal policies that are not in touch with Pennsylvania. I don't think they're in touch with most of America. They're going to take our country in the wrong direction. So it's the contrast between those policies versus common sense policies. And frankly, it's the contrast between the weakness that President Biden, Vice President Harris, Bob Casey have shown under the last three and a half years versus the strength that I think we saw under President Trump uh, when he was the president. And the kind of strength I think I can show as a combat veteran, as someone who's been a business leader. That's what the race is about. And I think the more that Pennsylvanians and Americans are able to see that contrast, I think the more beneficial it's going to be to my campaign and to the president's campaign. So you are seeing that contrast on policy. But when you look at the former president's rhetoric, um, he has been attacking her intelligence. He's been you know, criticizing her on a variety of different fronts that don't necessarily involve policy, these personal attacks. Yeah. Do you want him to stop? Listen, I, I've had a chance, I've, I, I've never done this before, but I, I've had a chance to attend three or four of President Trump's rallies mm. in the last, you know, two months. And, and i got to tell you, 95% of what he's saying about Vice President Harris are about the policies. That's just not what's reported, honestly. I, he is making that case over and over again. You know, President Trump has a, a way of, 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 uh, of communicating, a way of describing his opponent. You know, he's going to have his style. I'm going to have my style. I'm not going to critique his style. But I will say I think the case he's making is largely about policy, largely about his track record as the former president versus the track record of, uh, of President Biden and Vice President Harris. They were two together. Bob Casey, by the way, voted 99 percent of the time. So we have, we have a record to look at in both cases. I think President Trump's record is superior many times over. But we also have a future where President Trump's laid out a vision for the future that's based on a set of reasonable common sense policies. It's common sense to secure our border. It's common sense to uh, bring down inflation and make it a pro-business environment. It's common sense to bring law and order to our cities. Uh, Kamala Harris and Bob Casey have um, supported a set of policies that are in direct contrast with that. I think that's what this debate will hopefully be about and also what the campaign's about. And as I mentioned, this is the most eyed battleground state. Our CBS News polling shows a neck and neck race between Trump and Harris here. But it also shows that you're several points behind your Democratic opponent, Bob Casey, the incumbent senator. Why is that? Well, I was always going to be an underdog. I mean, this is, uh, this is a place where Bob Casey and his family have lived forever. He's an incumbent. And uh, Bob Casey's been in, in uh, office for 30 years, elected office. So um, I'm running against an incumbent. But what's happening is that uh, the polls are closing. I always said it's going to be a very close race. And uh, I think as Pennsylvanians see more and more, get to know who I am and see more and more of the contrast between his weak liberal uh, policies that he supported and voted for. We need to hold him accountable. He's been the sitting senator. Uh, versus what I can bring as an outsider, as someone who's, uh, who's been a veteran, someone who's been a business leader. That contrast, I think, is why you're seeing the polls close. I think it's why I'll, I'll ultimately win in November. And can Trump stay on message? And what does Harris have to do to reach voters in Pennsylvania? That's all coming up with our political panel, who's standing by to break it all down. You're streaming America Decides live from Philadelphia. Person goes into that voting booth, they're going to say, who has the values I believe in? 
who has the experience that we trust, who has the integrity and the stability to get the job done. Face. That was Vice President Kamala Harris's challenge to Donald Trump over the summer. And tonight, former the former president will be able to do just that. For more, let's bring in our political panel, Stephanie Lai and Maeve Rustin. Stephanie is national politics reporter for Bloomberg, and Maeve is national political reporter for The Washington Post. Ladies, great to have you both with us here. I know you've both been out on the campaign trail covering all these candidates. Um, Maeve, I want to start with you. Uh, you also are in California. You've yeah. covered Kamala Harris for a long time. What's so striking to me is that she is the sitting vice president, but yet she's kind of running as an outsider. And we know that the Trump campaign is really hoping tonight to attach all of Biden's policies to her, make her the insider, make it seem like she is the incumbent president, essentially. Um, knowing what you know about her and having covered her, how is her campaign responding to that? You know, it's so fascinating, like, how they are trying to make her the candidate of change. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. she is, you know, she would be a very different kind of president. Uh, you know, the first woman, obviously, her the first uh, black woman president. Mm -hmm. But those are things that she doesn't want to talk about at all. So the campaign feels that, you know, that I think that there's that visual contrast that we'll see on stage tonight that'll be really interesting for people. But she is going to have to really answer uh, the attacks that he's been making about, you know, why she didn't change things for people in a more rapid way as mm -hmm. vice president, whether it was lowering prices. Um, we saw that really tough video from Trump's campaign this morning mm -hmm. about that. And I think so how she threads the needle of not she, she's not going to try to distance herself too much from Biden, mm. but to argue that, you know, that that really it's it's been the Trump era for the last mm. 10 years, mm. um, you know, that he mm. never stopped running for president, mm. that he tried to overturn the election um, and that, you know, she would be a break from all of that. Mm. So it'll be really fascinating to see the way that she does that and whether it'll be successful, yeah. because for yeah. a lot of people, it may be pretty hard to swallow that argument. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's such an interesting point because, Stephanie, I mean, the past decade almost has been kind of defined by Donald Trump and politics. And, you know, it's fascinating to me that these two candidates have never met before because you think about Kamala Harris came in in 2016, was elected that same year. And as you know, her political career has in large part been shaped by kind of opposition to Donald Trump. And I'm curious from, you know, covering Trump as you have. You know, how, he's so well known. So many ideas about him seem to be baked in. I mean, how does he, you know, move the needle tonight, if at all? I think, if anything, the whole debate is really about whether or not Kamala Harris can move the needle. Mm -hmm. I think his senior advisors put it best uh, in a RNC press call today in saying that the stakes mm -hmm. are just so much higher for Harris because she has to essentially introduce herself to Americans. Mm -hmm. You know, we all do know her as vice president, but people don't necessarily know her political views as well. And so mm -hmm. this is really her moment to, you know, tell the American voters, this is what I want to see in the next four years. And mm -hmm. something that the Trump campaign has been narrowly focused on is telling voters that four years, her day one started three and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as, as we talked about, it's almost mm -hmm. as if she has to answer for the last uh, administration. Yeah, and, and what's so uh, also interesting is that, you know, Kamala Harris has debated a lot in her career, also, of course, in 2020, and she did a vice presidential debate, but this is her first presidential debate in this kind of setting. And I can't help but think of all the money that's been spent in this race, and we've had both conventions, and yet it is a neck-and-neck neck race. I mean, especially Amazing. here in Pennsylvania, it's 50-50 in our poll. Yeah, and, you know, she is, it's interesting, because in those earlier uh, debates that I covered um, in California, when mm -hmm. she was, you know, running for AG, or even earlier in her career, she had a real confidence back then and a toughness in those debates, particularly in the one-on-one -on -one matchups. Mm -hmm. And then we saw in 2019 her really struggle with her ideological footing. She was mm -hmm. on that stage with Bernie Sanders. Yeah. She was not comfortable, um, you know, with that far liberal um, ideological positioning. Yeah. And 
I think tonight, you know, she's kind of unapologetically flip-flopped on a ton of yeah. positions that she took in, yeah. in 2019. And it'll be interesting tonight um, to see her in that one-on-one -on -one setting and the way in which she explains, you know, where her values are. He's mm. going to clearly try to trip her up over and over again on mm. changing her position on fracking or mm. aspects of the immigration debate. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that she will try to, you know, show toughness, mm. but also really focus on introducing herself to voters, um, as you were talking about, because she is the only one with a lot of room to grow here. Mm. And so, you know, a lot yeah. of people weren't watching the convention, the, the yeah. voters that matter. That matter. Yeah. Um, and she has an opportunity tonight to, to do that reintroduction. So it may yeah. be less of the the punching that we're all mm -hmm. expecting mm -hmm. and more of her telling her story or trying to do so. Trying to. Yeah. I mean, and when we talk about voters who matter, of course, we're talking all voters matter. We're yeah, talking course, about the, 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 you know, that small group of people who this group seems to be dwindling every cycle, yeah. those undecided or independent voters. Um, and Stephanie, you know, can the Trump campaign reach out to them, convince them um, or is this a matter of using these moments to really rally the base to prepare to, to battle with with Harris's face? It could really be both. As you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, Pennsylvania is almost 50 50. A lot of these swing seats are really close in a way that this race wasn't necessarily positioned to be in, you know, just a couple months ago. Yeah. And so this is still a very crucial moment for Trump and his campaign. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if he can really focus on the Biden Harris uh, administration's record, mm -hmm. trying to set the record straight of, you know, what his administration accomplished, you know, that could mm -hmm. potentially sway a lot of independent voters. But of course, he has to stay on message, and that's something that his advisors are saying they expect him to do. But of course, yeah. this is you know former President Donald Trump that we're uh, mm -hmm. covering, so there are always moments of you know unexpected uh, quips or remarks to come out. There's also those like conservative voters out there who, you know, really were alienated by Trump, but mm. then drifted back because they, yeah. you know, really had issues with Biden's age, mm -hmm. um, whether he could deliver a message. And it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see how she tries to position herself tonight mm -hmm. to talk to those people. I mean, obviously, the campaign this week has been hitting so hard. The endorsement she has from military generals or the Dick Cheney endorsement, mm -hmm. which I think you and I thought we would never see in our <laughs> lifetime, right? Still can't um, believe it, yeah. But, you know, the way in which she talks about that tonight as sort of an example of how um, she would bring the country to a different place mm -hmm. as she tries to make Trump seem like, you know, someone who's only out for himself. Yeah, and this could be the first and only debate that we see between the two. Um, so we'll be watching for all that body language in the middle, in the beginning yeah. of the debate as well. Uh, Stephanie and May, thank you very much, thank both you. of you, for all your reporting, and we'll see you soon. And coming up, a surge of black women and young people registering to vote in Pennsylvania could spell trouble for former President Trump. We'll take a look at those numbers next on America Decides. Over the last eight years, this administration, along with Senator McCain, uh, have been solely focused on Iraq. That has been their priority. That has been where all our resources have gone. In the meantime, bin Laden is still out there. Welcome back to America Decides. A data firm is reporting a surge in the number of young women of color registering to vote ever since Kamala Harris became the 2024 Democratic nominee. According to Target Smart, voter registration in several battleground states among black women under the age of 30 was 183 percent higher during a week in July compared to the same week in 2020. And for Hispanic women in this same age group, registration was up 172 percent. Our Lilia Luciano was, uh, has been following all of that and is here with us in Philadelphia. Lilia, good to see you. So good um, to see you, Katie. So tell me a little bit about what, this data and what you've learned. So part of what I've learned is that, as you can imagine, a lot of it comes down to identity. Mm. The numbers are not just remarkable comparing this same week, the same week when the data was taken mm -hmm. uh, back in 2020 and now, but if you compare the week before Joe Biden dropped out of the race mm. and the week that Kamala Harris became the nominee, there is mm. also a significant difference, more than mm. a doubling in the number of Hispanic and black young women, women under 30, who were registering. One of the main things that I heard from them is about identity. It mm. is about representation, as you can imagine. And I want to take a listen to some of what they said. 
As women, you have to think about the way that you say things, the way that you dress, the way that you talk. To be able to see a woman in office, to jump, know that she jumped through every single hurdle to get there, it's so amazing to see and it's you can't help but be admire her and be inspired. And so part of what some of these young women were telling me, it's not just representation in terms of breaking that glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. It's not just voting or having the possibility of voting for somebody who reminds them of themselves or their mothers, mm -hmm. but her lived experience, mm -hmm. thinking that maybe the issues that affect them personally are something mm -hmm. that Vice President Harris would also connect with. I mean, that change just in that short amount of time, as you mentioned, is yeah. really striking. Um, and, you know, we, you and I have been talking to young voters across the country this election cycle, and, you know, I'm curious if there's been a noticeable change in kind of issues they care about or enthusiasm. And as you've been talking to some of these voters, are there issues in particular that they are focused on? Absolutely. I think the main issue that I keep encountering mm -hmm. where very young people care about deeply more mm -hmm. than older people mm -hmm. has been the war in Gaza and the mm -hmm. Biden administration's uh, connection to that, mm -hmm. um, the Biden administration's policy. I've met a lot of protesters mm -hmm. across the country, mostly very young people, college mm -hmm. students and people you know, in their 20s and 30s who mm -hmm. say we will pay attention mm -hmm. to the message that comes from Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. You know, while she has addressed the issue, we want to hear a little bit more, so they might pay mm -hmm. more attention to that. But of course, mm -hmm. as you have heard from many voters, there's mm -hmm. abortion, there's mm -hmm. immigration, mm -hmm. and uh, there is even one of the students that we talked to at Temple University was telling me the importance of her feeling like Vice President Harris connects or is committed to the middle class. I want to play another little bit of sound from what they told us and come back. I think gun reform is a really big issue, especially with that recent shooting. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about it, so I think everybody would like to see some change there. And Kamala, a lot of um, her posts or what she's been talking about is her commitment to the middle class, which I think would also really like bolster our country. I was thinking more about like abortion laws and then immigration laws. Um, Abortion law is mainly because, like, I am a woman and I think that it's important for us to have control over our own bodies. And that's something that I heard from several college students. I mean, this student in particular, Savannah Curry, who is a basketball athlete at Temple University, was telling me that she went to an international school. And even though she personally was not directly mm -hmm. affected by immigration, nor was her family, mm -hmm. that she had a best friend from Dominican Republic, that mm -hmm. she had another great friend from China, and that she is listening and paying attention mm -hmm. to what the policy on immigration will be, the mm -hmm. way that migrants, that asylum seekers will be treated, dealt with, and addressed, mm -hmm. especially in their humanity. And it's such a good reminder, Lilia, about how people's positions on all these issues are so nuanced and so yeah. personal for them as well. And, and just quickly, I mean, we're here in Pennsylvania, the biggest battleground state. I know you've been talking to political experts as well about this voter registration. What have they been saying? So part of what they've been saying is, look, you can easily underestimate college students, mm. but in a state like this, where mm. I was looking at the data, the top 10 uh, universities and colleges here mm. with the highest enrollment, just the mm. top 10 among many others have about 240,000 students. As mm. you know, Biden won 2020 by just 80,000. So, so easy to underestimate that population. If they're yeah. registering and voting, yeah. that says something. Such a good point. Uh, those numbers are fascinating, and I know a lot of people are interested in whether that means turnout yeah. in the election. Uh, Lilia, as always, thank you thank so you. much. Good to see you here in Philadelphia. And that does it for us today. We'll be back. Actually, we'll be back at the 7 p.m. hour for our continuing coverage of the first presidential debate between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump. The Daily Report with John Dickerson starts right after the break. You're streaming America Decides.